Um, Yvonne, are you going to be doing the interviewing? Yeah, I am. Yeah. Probably would be best, yeah, because I don't know anything. <laughs> but I'll, I will introduce that Yvonne is here. Petra Wheel is going to introduce Tracy. Tracy is representing an original for us. We like these original interviews. Something a little bit unusual, as I've heard so far. All I know is what would it feel like to you if you were a single mom or single person and a job offer landed on your lap and you're abroad and you haven't really prepared for your trip to New Zealand. Tracy, is that generally the situation you were in or am I way off base? No, that's correct, Tate. I had absolutely no intention of immigrating. And yes, I landed a job offer and here I am. Two okay, months well, the I'll save the big story for yeah. you and, and uh, Yvonne to get into and uh, I'll leave you to it. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks, Tate. Cool. Um, yeah, so Tracy approached me in September asking about vehicle finance um, and she landed in Christchurch. Um, and I didn't know too much about Tracy's story until we've been communicating so much to get her car that, um, down that side from Auckland. She bought a car up on the North Island, um, which turned to be a bit more challenging because Tracy's working hours and having to get all the documents ready. But yeah, we're getting there. Um, it's, the <laughs> yeah, it's almost there. <laughs> um, and as I got to know Tracy, I found out that she's a single mom of three boys, which when I heard that, I was really intrigued by her story, especially because I've had so many messages from single moms who just really are desperate to get their children out of South Africa, but they are so scared of you know, doing it on their own. Um, they don't have that partner to support them, um, the fear of the unknown. Um, obviously, in their own way, feeling a bit inferior, like if you read most of the stories on all the groups, it's definitely couples coming over. Um, when I heard Tracy's story, I just thought it would be really inspiring for her herself to share it with everybody else. Um, so yeah, that's why I mentioned to her in the week, well, I'd love to have her on here. Um, and I, I actually messaged quite a few of the moms as well, um, who are in South Africa. And I just think it's a great story, positive, and it shows that it, it really can be done. Um, so yeah, um, Tracy, do you want to tell them a bit about what you did in South Africa and what type of life you lived around your children as a single mom? Um, yes, Yvonne, I was an operational paramedic in South Africa for 25 years. I had my own ambulance service and occupational health and safety training center. Um, I lived my life on adrenaline. I was on call 24 seven. Mm. I literally lived my life past my, my kids. Yeah, my blood bled Zululand. Mm. Of course. And how old are your children? My children are 12, 15 and 19. Oh, wow. Okay. That's, yeah. Um, so they're more teenage years. Um, and had you ever thought of coming anywhere overseas before? No, I hadn't. In actual fact, my sister is a Canadian, um, Canadian citizen. She's lived there for many years and she'd often tried to coast me across to Canada. And really, I would just laugh at her. So all immigration is not for me. I'm happy here. It's my comfort zone. So no, I never had any intention of, of leaving the comfort, the life that I had in South Africa. And where in South Africa were you? I lived on a small holding, um, a couple of acres in Kwambo Nambi, which is 25 kilometers north of Richards Bay, which is on the north coast. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And the big question, how did you come across your job offer? <laughs> <laughs> it was actually through a friend of mine. His daughter works for the company and he just mentioned to me that they were looking for staff members and told me to send my CV across. And um, I laughed at him, put it on the back burner and he was very persistent. I eventually put together a CV. I followed the Seek, um, the Seek CV. I loaded it, uploaded it onto Seek and I dropped an email to his daughter with my CV and the rest is history. Wow, so really not something you expected to happen at all. And did you have communication with the company in between um, once you received your CV? Yes, I did. It was sent down to the South Island manager because obviously after hearing about the job, um, we were told that it would probably be on the South Island. 
I, we did a lot of homework and my Google Kings in the home decided that the South Island was where we were going. And um, that, yeah, they, um, this, they, they contacted me. I was actually offered a job down south, right down in Chicago. And after signing the job offer, they asked if I would mind going to run the, the operation from Dunedin. So we jumped at that opportunity because I have three kids, of which two of them are teenagers and one varsity age. And yeah, they contacted me a couple of times. It was fantastic. We had what's up interviews in actual fact. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that is great. And <laughs> very modern. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And were you at all document ready when you submitted your CV or was that something you had to do in that short time? And when did you get your job offer? No, not at all. Um, I signed my job offer on the 24th of June and the next day I applied for police clearance. And from there I followed Immigration New Zealand website and the awesome Facebook groups that you guys belong to. And I started getting myself document ready. I knew I had four or five weeks because of the delay with the police clearance certificate. So that gave me a little bit of playing time. And um, I started to get all the other documents in place while I was waiting for my police clearance. And when it came down to visa time, did you do everything yourself? Did you use an agent? What was your main source of information? I know you mentioned the Facebook groups and obviously the INZ website. Was that very helpful for you? Yes, it definitely was. Um, I did it all myself. We didn't use any agents. I did a lot of searching on the Facebook groups and um, I studied the Immigration New Zealand website. Once we were document ready and I felt comfortable enough, I did the application directly with Immigration New Zealand. And then a lot of people tell me when the time comes, they've got to tell family and friends and they can, in many cases, get a lot of appeal or nasty comments saying that you're up and going and running away and it's not the right thing to do. Um, so what type of feedback did you get from people that you told? Um, a lot of my friends commented about how I would want to move to the bottom of the world. You couldn't get any closer to the South Pole. So I just told them if you turn the map around, we're sitting at the top and the top you have a beautiful view. My, my family were ecstatic, specifically my mom and dad because they just wanted to see their grandkids leaving South Africa and starting a new life. Bearing in mind, I have three boys. There's not much opportunity for three boys in South Africa. So they were very, very supportive. Um, a lot of people commented on the fact that I was leaving Richards Bay, which would peak temperatures of 50, 52 degrees in summer, to come across to Dunedin, where we'd be lucky if it gets to 25 in summer. But in general, I had a lot of support. You know, you do get the odd green people. I think, you know, a lot of things that are said, it's just when it comes to crunch time, they're, they're actually jealous in their own way, but you just turn it around as something positive. Yeah, definitely. And how did your children react when you told them that you were going to be leaving everything you know and starting over here? They were ecstatic. I think they thought they were going on a permanent holiday. And I think to, to this day, they think they're on a permanent holiday. <laughs> um, <laughs> they googled everything I have google kings specifically my 15 year old he had 1001 facts about Dunedin and in Chicago that you could ask him a question and he would answer it I think every fact and statistic that was ever written about Dunedin my 15 year old could recite oh wow Oh, well, that's, that's exciting. And I think that's good for people. Uh, a question I get asked a lot, I mean, my oldest is only nine, so people want to know how did um, he feel when we told him that we were going to be immigrating. So I think it's really nice for people to hear with older children um, the excitement that your kids had. Um, my 12-year-old, my I had worried a bit about my 12-year-old because he's a little socialite and he had a really good, strong um, group of friends back in South Africa. And I had really worried about him initially. And um, he's the one that surprised us the most. He's the one that settled the fastest. Has He lives past me now with his social life. Yeah, that's nice. Um, I think that's very encouraging for many. And um, Tracy, did you guys come with your suitcases, a container, cube? How did you do it? We bought the good old pet bags. 
and we packed our pep bags. In total, we had 50 kilograms each. So it was 43 kilograms of checked in luggage and seven kilos of hand luggage. I don't even think we reached that, um, there were four of us. And we packed up our clothes and I had one pet bag full of wool, which everyone still laughs about because I crochet. So <laughs> 23 kilos was set aside for wool. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, pretty, I'm pretty glad I did because wool, in spite of the fact I see sheep everywhere, wool is very expensive in New Zealand. <laughs> Oh, there's loads of sheep. <laughs> oh gosh, that and then I also wanted the price of meat is so expensive because so many sheep. <laughs> I know, it's ridiculous. But yeah, we kind of bought our clothes um, and a couple of, you know, sentimentals. We have, we have got six of those big, big gym boxes. I had six boxes at home. So I kind of gave the boys each a box and I said, well, pack up what you feel that you would like to have in the next three months if there's anything of value. So my 15 year old is a reader. So he has sets of books. So he literally has, I think a 95 kilo big gym full of books. And we've got six um, of these boxes coming over with 12 frames. Um, I had a couple of accolades having been businesswoman of the year back in South Africa. So oh. a couple of frames in that, that we packed up. So that's on the ship. On, it should be arriving here, will they say to me mid-December, so we might have a Christmas present. Oh, that's great. And what was it like finding um, a house to rent or where you are? That's the question. That's okay, that is a challenge. Dunedin is a challenge to get accommodation. We, as you know, we had stayed in Christchurch for a week because I'd had training up there, so we stayed in the backpackers up there which was awesome for the boys because they just got to know all the international tourists that were coming in and out. And I was quite comfortable because they were around other people while I was in training. And you can't get accommodation unless you're here. Well, let's not say you can't. You really battle to get accommodation in Dunedin unless you're here because of the way they work. You know, you have to go to viewings. So from Christchurch, we came down and we stayed at the holiday park. So I would book us in for a week while trying to look for accommodation and kind of extend it every Friday. Um, my challenge in finding accommodation, why it took a little bit longer, was as soon as I arrived in Dunedin, I went down to Chicago for two nights, then I was back, and then I was back in, in Tiana for a night or two. So I wasn't here for the viewing, so I really did battle to find accommodation. The boys, of course, loved it because they got to stay at the holiday park, and there were just reams of friends coming in and out. Yeah. Um, eventually I got hold of an agent and um, I found the property that we in. It took us about 10 days to find this property and um, we, we found exactly what we wanted in the area that we wanted. The challenge being I had to enroll my children into a school while we were still at the holiday park because I was un we were unsure of how long we would be looking for accommodation. So the added challenge to me was I had to find accommodation in the area for the, the two schools that the children were at because they're in primary, one's in primary and one's in high. So there was a little bit of extra pressure to find a place nearby. Because of my working commitments, they have to be able to walk or cycle to school. So, yeah, we found ourselves a property under one kilometre to both schools. Oh, that's great. That's really nice, especially with you working away. Um, and I see... Um, Carl asked a question, um, and I think it's really appropriate for you having three children. Um, what are your work hours like now? Um, I work, <laughs> okay, that's a bit difficult. I'm supposed to work from 7.30 to 4.30. However, we do work on demand. So, like on Friday, I mean, you know I was off on Friday. Um, Monday, I only have to work from 2 to 7, and then Tuesday, I'm away in Chicago for another two nights. So it, it really depends on where the work is taking me, but they don't overwork us at all. And, you know, they're very diligent in paying you overtime if you work over a certain number of hours. My working conditions are fantastic, absolutely fantastic. And Veronica asked, how were the employers there with regards to moms having kids? So would you say they understanding? Should you have, um, you know, something to attend to for your children? My um, manager, South Island manageress is awesome. She is so accommodating. Um, they, 
I've had a few challenges. You know, I had to get kids into school. I landed, let me just give you a quick um, recap. I landed on the 13th, on Friday, the 13th of September. <laughs> and I started work on Monday, the 16th. So wow. I was in training in Christchurch for that week. We then hired ourselves a vehicle and we drove down to Dunedin on the weekend. And I was back at work on the Monday. My, my boss was so accommodating when I would, if I wasn't tra in training or um, busy on site, I would just say to you, you know what, I've got two hours between clients. Can I please just pop up to the school? I need to enroll them at the schools. Um, I managed to do, while I was in Christchurch in training that week, I managed to do my IRD as well as convert my driver's license and open up a local bank account. Um, and they transferred everything down to Dunedin as soon as we moved down here. She was really accommodating. And I have found that with quite a few people that I've gotten to know, my cousin is on her way now. She's leaving on Sunday. She's moving to Christchurch. And she's also a single mom. She's got a son. And her boss is exactly the same. She, she's even helped to find a school for her child. Wow, that's really amazing. I'm... It's all about family. New Zealand is all about family. And they... they they push for family and they understand the core family values and they understand how important it is um, the fact to keep the family unit together. Yeah, which in your case is very important. Um, and I think that's a, if everybody asks that question. Um, so would you say you feel the work-life balance here in New Zealand? Oh, yes. I have so much time now. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. uh, my kids live past me now. Previously, it was I lived past them and they would kind of see me in passing. It was I'd walk in an hour later, my phone would ring and it would be back into uniform and out I went. Um, they, I had no social life for many years. I mean, I've been divorced for seven years. I've had no social life. Now, I have so much time on my hands. Even though I'm away for two or three nights every week, maybe every second week, I just have so much time that I end up quite often at home going, well, where are my kids? Yeah, which is great. And at least here, yeah, I'm sure, you, I mean, they can walk to school and back and you don't have to worry about a thing. Do your kids walk to the shops as well? My kids have bicycles. My 12-year-old is on his bike all the time. He cycles to and from school. You know, a bicycle safety is actually a subject at school. So they get taught all the different aspects of bicycle safety. He's on his bicycle up and down everywhere. The other two have also um, got themselves bicycles, but my middle one prefers to walk. Um, but they out. My teenagers will go out until two o'clock in the morning up into town. We live we live about three kilometers from city centre. We're in the flat area, and um, I have no care in the world. It's not no fear in the world when they go out for a beer and I know they're walking home at two o'clock in the morning. It's just I've had to change my whole pattern of thinking because back in South Africa, it was, where are you going? What are you doing? What time are you going to be home? Phone me. You're not walking. Here, it's, they out their cycle at 10 o'clock at night. I actually went out for a cycle at 11 o'clock last night with my eldest, and we cycled through city centre. That's just amazing. You don't have to worry that you're going to be mugged or anything really bad is going to happen. That's just great. <laughs> It's fantastic. I run and I went for an 8K run the other day and I was running along the harbour. There's this beautiful area to run sort of up towards St. Leonard's. And I did an 8K and I was all on my own on this footpath and I didn't have to worry about being mugged for my shoes, my cell phone, keeping everything close to you. It's just, it's just a different lifestyle. And with you, um, you furnished your place out, um, obviously from scratch. Uh, so overall, would you say New Zealand is more expensive or what's your view no. on that? No, honestly, it's relative once you're earning dollars. I think the biggest mistake we make is the conversion. We convert everything into rands and then go, oh, that's so expensive. Once you're earning dollars, it's relative. And so saying, I furnished my house in rands because I, it was the money that I had um, brought over with me. So to furnish a house in rands is, is pretty costly. However, I still think it's a lot cheaper than having arranged a, um, a container to bring all your stuff over. Here you can buy things on Facebook Marketplace and trade me mint condition. We have a, a lounge suite, an L-shaped lounge suite that opens up into a uh, double bed 
the double bed had never even been opened. It doesn't, it barely looked like the lounge suit was sat on. We picked it up for $650. Brand new, they're 27. So $2,700. So it's just, you, you've got to you've got to be prepared to get second hand, but then be careful on what you get second hand. But it's not like South Africa where people will do you in. Here, they they take pride in the stuff that they hand over to you. Yeah, and do you miss anything from back home? Um, <laughs> I had this chat with a friend of mine the other day, and I said I feel terrible, but I don't. Uh, I I miss my housekeeper. I had a living housekeeper. <laughs> no, I miss my housekeeper. It sounds terrible. I don't miss anything else but my housekeeper. He was my absolute life. He lived with us for 15 years. Wow. He cooked and cleaned and he was my security guard. I'm my absolutely everything. If, if there's one thing that I could bring here, it would be my housekeeper. Oh, that's amazing. Especially if you had him for so long. Um... So I think it's pretty much safe to say that you're very happy that you made this decision and so are your boys. Oh, most definitely. Uh, I, I sometimes think why didn't it sooner, but God's grace brought us here at this time. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And you say your children settled in okay? Did it take a certain uh, one of them a bit longer than the others? No, not at all. They, um, they fitted in from the beginning. They had... Oh, I think the first five weeks off because we landed here and then the school holiday started, I think two weeks later. So they ended up with an extended holiday, but um, which gave them time to explore and get to know certain areas. But um, no, they've done very well. Oh, I couldn't cool. have done this without them. They, I have the right boys for this adventure. Yeah, that's just amazing, really. Um, thanks so much for taking your time to share the story. I'm sure it's positively inspired so many other people who will be listening. Ah, uh, sure, I hope so. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks, Yvonne. Uh, the questions and issues raised are something that a lot of people will resonate with. So, what's next? Guess what's next? Julia Cook, immigration agent, has some news for us on the ANSCO codes. And uh, ANSCO, it's good news. So for a select number of ANSCO codes that are um, quite unique, quite unusual, uh, there are some changes with them that's going to benefit those people with those ANSCO codes if they're seeking work in, the, in that area. Uh, I can't go any further because that would look probably a little bit too close like I'm giving advice, which I'm not. But she's just going through those things with us next. And that next will be when I bring her on. And I'm going to bring her on when I record this uh, video, when I put, edit it together. So actually, she's already recorded that with me. She had to go to the UK, right? So I recorded that with her, and it's, and it's done. So my introduction is done. Her, her thing is done. You'll get it tomorrow. If you watch the archive of this show, here we are. We are here with some changes in immigration law. This is what some of you have been waiting for. Immigration law does have changes. There are people who can talk about it and people who can't. Uh, we can't, and Julia Cook can, because she's an agent. She's an immigration agent. Julia Cook, what are these immigration changes all about, and who, wh what should we know about them? Well, this, this change is actually a, quite a, um, a significant one for those people that were previously unable to apply for residency. There's a certain list of occupations now that have been upgraded, so which is fantastic news. Um, and those people now will be able to apply for a three-year work visa. Um, and residency in some cases. So if they earn the medium income, which is at the moment at $25, um, shortly to increase to $25.50 sometime this month, um, then they are going to be eligible, which is fantastic news. Um, so there is a little link that um, we have with the list of occupations there. So if you see, on, see your occupation on that list, then it's great news for you. Um, so I think, um, yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah so if you get a job or you or you're in a job that has been upgraded uh, but you're not paid the median income so you haven't quite reached that $25 yet then you will still be falling under current policy where you're not eligible um, so you might need to negotiate a higher pay rate to to kind of cross that that line 
And if by some chance you have your application lodged with Immigration New Zealand at the moment and it was submitted before this change happened, then you will automatically be, be considered under the new rule, which is unusual for them to do that. So usually when an application is submitted, it's processed under policy at that time of submission. But in applications in this particular policy change, then it'll be um, retrospectively treated. So it's great news for those people who've already been submitted. They might get a bonus there with a three-year work visa that they weren't expecting. Okay, and that applies to, correct me if I'm wrong, but as I heard, the, pe the, the people on this who qualify for this list, who are, who are well, let's say, put it like this, who are registered under these codes. Mm -hmm, correct, yes. So there's some really interesting codes on there. So we're going from care workers to bungee jump instructors. It's I saw that one, the bungee jumper. So are these considered specialist New Zealand sort of, um, it's a qualitative analysis, isn't it? It's not just what New Zealand needs, it's what makes New Zealand special in a way. It is, and it's collaborative with, with Australia, of course, because it is the ANSCO, the Australia and New Zealand standard classification of occupations list. So um, they've had, they've, finally kind of given it an overhaul because it's been in its current form for many years so it did need a bit of an upgrade and they've looked at those particular occupations and decided yeah they are actually a higher skill than we had had originally given them so um, it's, it's great news for a lot of people. So this is good news overall it affects these people especially well that qualify under these ANSCO codes correct so far? Correct so far. Okay and it and it does it negatively who does it negatively impact? It doesn't negatively impact anyone. I think it's only only positive um, because you're getting the, the pathway to residency that was, wasn't there before unless you had a really high salary because under old rules, you would need 37.50 an hour to make that work for residency, which, which is not likely, unfortunately, in those types of jobs. I see. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, what we can do here with this link is we'll include it in the text people can just look it up themselves and see if they comply to that. Yeah, yes, please do. And any questions, then fire them through. All right. Thank you, Julia, for that update. You're welcome. So, Julia, I have a question. This is a global question about the uh, New Zealand leadership. We do have New Zealand creating some laws, immigration. There's always some changes in some of these things. Do you find leadership today going down a track that is quite productive and long, long term of view for a benefit of New Zealand? Or do you find it something that's been always the same throughout all of the different administrations? Well, I think they all have their own little take on things and always think that they're doing the right things for the country at that time. And I think the current government have some good ideas on how they want to attract migrants and, and what sort of migrants they want, but they sometimes let themselves down with the actual implementation and delivery of, of immigration policies that are actually functional. So, and then the system breaks and, and that's, you know, some, yeah, the wheels do come off occasionally. And th this particular um, transition period we're going through now with essential skills and this whole um, accreditation thing, we're, yeah, we'll have to see how it actually works in, in practical terms. Well, because in theory, I see where they're going with it, but we've got to actually deliver that to, to employers and, and migrants. So, yeah, we'll have to wait and see how it plays out. So when you say you see where they're going with it, you see the benefits of how it could be implemented, and you wonder if that's going to be implemented as they envision. Yeah, yeah. So I think the intentions are to attract High quality, high quality migrants that New Zealand needs to fill all of our skill shortages because there, there is, you know, that skill shortage list is still quite significantly long. But they do lose sight of the fact that we need the, the lower skills there as well because there's a huge gap in the market there and we just haven't got enough, enough there to fill like the hospitality roles that we've got, the caregiving roles, the, the viticulture and the horticulture. So it's, there's a lot out there. That, that haven't been addressed yet, so maybe okay. that's uh, Last question, any opinion about this administration versus previous? You've been in the game for 12 years, you've seen a few administrations, any opinions personally, or would you prefer not to compare? I will decline to answer that question. <laughs> okay, all right, very good. 
Uh, thank you, Julia, for your time. You're welcome.